because they want convertible preferred stock with liquidated preferences, liquidation preferences, and, and on and on and on. I, I might tell you, well, for the first 18 months, you know, B&S Corporation, it's a pass-through entity, profits and losses pass through to the, the people, who are the shareholders in the company, um, and then we can break the S election just by telling the IRS that we want to become an S corporation. On the other hand, if you walk through the door and you say, well, you know what, um, I, I really think we can bootstrap this. I'm going to probably need a half million dollars in angel money, um, and that will probably tide us along while we create code or do whatever it is that we, we need to do. Uh, a limited liability company might be a very good answer. So you take away, ought to be, it's situation specific. Don't let the tax dog wag, uh, or the tax tail wag the dog, because while you theoretically, and you'll, you'll read literature to this effect that, well, you, if, you, if you do a limited liability company, you can just convert it into a C corporation, and um, you know, what's the big deal, there's no problem. What we've seen is if you get way down the road as a limited liability company, you can get into a situation where you have um, something called liabilities in excess of basis. You've accumulated losses and you have liabilities for the company. When you go to convert to a C corporation, what the IRS says is, oh, you as a member of the limited liability company really were legally indirectly legally obligated for these liabilities and now because you've converted to a C corporation those have been erased guess what you now have deemed income in an amount equal to what those liabilities were above and beyond what you paid for your membership interest so you get what's called in the trade phantom equity or a phantom income which is income that you have to report to the internal revenue service without the cash to, to pay the, the tax liability. So you really, you really need to be thoughtful and um, talk to somebody who does this kind of, you know, this kind of work all the time because if you go and get the simplistic tax-driven answer or go off the, on a, you know, read a book or on the internet, um, what, what those resources can't do is take a situation and translate it into an actionable piece of advice. And that's what, a, that's what somebody who does uh, work in the venture capital area can do. So this, um, this is just kind of a um, handy little takeaway. These are generally the forms that you can use. You don't need to be really thinking about things like a partnership or anything like that. This is where you're going to focus your attention. Um, I'm not going, to, you know, not, not going to really spend a whole lot of time on this. One of, the, one of the reasons that you really need to think long and hard, and this is worth talking about, if you look at um, C Corporation, double taxation is, is a fact of life. So what does that mean? A C Corporation pays tax at the corporate level and then income is um, taxed again as it's distributed to shareholders. Where does that really matter? Well, you just need to do the math. So on an exit transaction, if you're in an exit transaction, you've been wildly successful, you've built the next Facebook or whatever it is, and uh, you're about to exit the company, and your acquirer on the exit is saying, I don't want to buy your stock because I'm concerned about liabilities. I'm going to buy your assets. Money comes into the corporation. The corporation, right now, the marginal tax rate for corporations in the United States, 35%. 35% goes to Uncle Sam. Oh, OK. Well, that's not terrible. Well, what happens then is that the corporation does a liquidating distribution of those proceeds to the shareholders. And those shareholders look at their combined marginal tax rate of um, federal tax, state tax, Social Security, FICA, FUTA, Medicare, Medicaid, yak, yak, yak. The effective tax rate applicable to that transaction can be north of 70%. So you really, really need to, to be thinking about 
well, if I'm going to be a C, okay, I'm doing it with thought behind it because I know that that's the only way I'm going to raise the money to get the thing off the ground, and I will run the risk that on exit I'm going to be able to, uh, in fact, sell stock <coughs> instead of <coughs> selling assets. So, um, kind of talking out of <laughs> both sides of my mouth. So the, the, the tax stuff uh, really does have importance. It's not the sole determinant, but it's something that you can't uh, afford to ignore. So there's kind of a, a differential equation here. You need to be thinking tax and raising capital at, at the same time. All of these entities will do the job as far as protecting you from personal liability. They all have con continuity of life. Um, you know, some of them, and that's corporation, has uh, restrictions on ownership. I recently ran into this with um, folks looking to spin up a company, and two of them were foreign nationals, and you can't use an S corporation because of the Internal Revenue Service regulations. And so we were looking between C corporation and limited liability company. Um, so anyway, enough on that. Uh, when, when you when you get you take away ought to be that uh, it is not a one-dimensional consideration. You really need to look at at least four or five different factors, and then look at your crystal ball, and then put your finger up and see which way the wind's blowing, and then hopefully you make a, a, a good initial determination uh, of which end that you get into. How are we doing on time? Close. Close. All right. So, <laughs> basics of. Um, We're all used to going over. Well, we'll just, we'll just rush through the legal stuff. I mean, you know what the heck. Uh, so, corporate organization. I mean, this this really isn't rocket science. So, uh, articles. You've got bylaws. You've got a board of directors. You have a president. You have a chairman. You have uh, you know a CTO. A, you know whatever chief scientific officer. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. All of that's pretty rote. Okay, you can go to Legal Zoom. Hate, hate it if you did that, but if you go to Legal Zoom and you can get a, a set of documents. Where the rubber really hits the road is the last item that's listed here, which is the shareholders agreement. That has to do with um, contractual agreements between shareholders that deal with. Uh, issues of control. I'm the founder of the company. I want a shareholders agreement that says that as long as I am actively involved in the company, the shareholders agree to vote their shares to elect me as president, CEO, whatever. You know, that's a control issue. Rights of first refusal. These are always closely held corporations. If somebody gets an offer from your worst competitor to buy their interests in the company, which, oh, by the way, would give them, under the laws of every state in the union, access to your books and records. Do you want that to happen? Yes, no. A shareholders agreement would say, well, if you get an offer for your shares, you have to come back to us first. We get to match. The company gets to match the offer. And if the company doesn't or won't or is unwilling to match the offer than the other shareholders because we, we're all going to be in this enterprise and you want to sell it to our worst competitor. We want to be able to protect ourselves and, and we'll match that offer. You're not going to suffer economically, but we want to protect the enterprise going forward. Preemptive rights. This is an anti-dilution protection that you see in some shareholders agreement, which is, well, um, I know we're going to have to raise outside capital and I don't want to be diluted down to some inconsequential percentage ownership. So I want the right that if the company goes out to raise capital that I can put in more money on the same terms and conditions to preserve my percentage interest in, in the company. So I, I want a preemptive right. Very key. Tag along and drag along rights. Protection on the one hand for minority shareholders and um, for the majority shareholders on the, on the other hand. Tag along is, gee, the owners of 51% of the company decide to sell their stock to whomever. Um, I'm a minority shareholder. 
Am I crazy about being left behind? You guys are having a liquidity event. You're making a lot of money. Uh, if there's not a shareholders agreement that says that the minority gets to tag along into that transaction and cash out, at least pro rata, maybe not 100%, that can happen. They can end up standing there, still owning the shares, and now the company, the majority control has changed hands. They, haven't, they don't have any cash, and maybe they're not particularly crazy about the people who just took it over. Not a good scenario. Drag along rights. Protect, you know, you want to protect against the tyranny of the minority. The deal of the century comes along. John, Mary, whomever, gets the bright idea. Well, gee, if I hold out and I own 10% of this company, uh, I'll bet you I can get a better deal than the other 90% did because they really want my last, that last 10%, they, they don't want an untidy deal. So I'm going to pull a stick up and say that I'm not going to sell unless I get 20% more for my stock or my membership interest than, than the other folks. Terrible, and it, and it can really derail a transaction. We've seen instances in which the acquirer will say, go straighten it out, come see us when you have something worked out. Um, we have no interest in getting in the middle of this, this messy situation. So. Articles, bylaws, board of directors, yeah, all very important stuff. Shareholders agreement, what we see all too often is, it, you know, at the, at the starting point of a company, legal dollars are, are very dear. This is probably the most important money that you can, you can spend. The rest of it's kind of off the rack standard stuff, but the shareholders agreement, you really need to spend some, some time on. Limited liability company, all these same considerations. The nomenclature is different, so you don't file articles of incorporation, you file articles of organization, you get a certificate of, that should say certificate of organization. Um, basically, not a whole lot of difference. Um, the one key difference in the organic documents is in a corporation you'll have bylaws that set out what the governance of the company looks like, uh, and then you'll have a separate buy, sell, or uh, shareholders agreement. Uh, in a, a limited liability company, you get a much longer operating agreement that does double duty. It will have provisions dealing with governance, and it will also have buy, sell, and conflict resolution provisions. Equity, we talked about this over lunch. <laughs> you really need to look at this carefully. Um, in some cases, you are not going to have cash to do whatever it is that you need to do. For your company, I'll give you a real life example. We've got a, a company uh, with a uh, treatment for macular, wet, uh, age related macular degeneration, small molecule therapy. And right now, that company uh, turned away a venture capital off offer number of years ago and now needs to do clinical trials. They're going to do them in India and they are using equity in the company. We can't pay you cash, Indian CRO, but what we're going to do is we will, for every stage of the company uh, or every stage of the project that you complete, we will um, give you shares valued at 90 cents a share. So they're spending shares like you would, like you would spend money. Where people are involved, if you're, if you're giving up equity, sometimes depending on the way you position that, they can end up with tax liabilities because um, the shares that you're giving them have value. It's that phantom income problem again. They got value. The IRS says you owe taxes. They don't have any cash. Be careful about that. Obviously, use it for financing with angel or venture capital groups. A lot depends on how much you're going to give up. Depends on valuation of the company. That's a, a whole day's presentation in and of itself, but do the math. The more highly valued or the initial valuation of the company is, the less number, fewer number of shares you're going to have to give up to get a given amount of dollars. So um, you will use some of that uh, equity for financing. And sometimes, you know, even equipment providers uh, in some special circumstances.